Thank you. So I'm really happy to be here today as part of the symposium. I'm going to talk about insect decline, some of the research that's out there showing that insects are declining globally. I'm going to talk about pollinators in particular, and then I'm going to talk about the ways that climate change can affect pollinators and some of the things we can do um, to help. So I'm with the Xerces Society. We're a nonprofit focused on invertebrate conservation. And our name comes from the Xerces blue butterfly, which is the first butterfly in North America known to have gone extinct due to human activity. So that's where our name comes from. So the insect apocalypse. This has been in the news, right? This is from the New York Times. And it refers to this growing body of data showing us that insect populations are declining globally. Um, so just to make sure we're on the same page here, when I talk about biodiversity, what does that word mean? It refers to the variety and variability of life on Earth. So not just the number of species on the planet, but also the variation among individuals within species. So all of that different variety that we see in the biosphere contributes to this term biodiversity. And what we're finding is that biodiversity of insects is declining. And this has been shown in uh, several um, long-term studies from, from different parts of the world looking at different insect taxa. And some people describe this as the windshield effect, right? I can remember as a kid driving through the country and your windshield would be covered in bug guts, right? Or the, or the grill. And that doesn't happen as much anymore, right? And it's taken a few decades maybe to notice this change, but it's there. So it's something we're starting to see and pay attention to. There just aren't as many insects in the environment. So there's this growing awareness of that more and more long-term studies are coming out documenting what we're noticing in our windshields. So this figure is from a recent review paper. And what they did is they went through the literature, so looked at all these peer-reviewed papers, and asked how many of these papers are documenting declines in insect populations. So they found 73 studies showing um, declines in insects. And these bars show the different studies. So a short bar means only one or two papers. A really tall bar means lots of studies, right? So we see lots of, lots of documentation in Europe and the US, where a lot of this research has been ongoing. So there's a lot of evidence that insects are declining there. Um, fewer studies in different parts of the world. OK, there's just less research, um, long-term research that's been going on in some of these other regions. But what we do know is that the factors causing insect declines in the US and in Europe are also operating in these other parts of the world. So it's reasonable to conclude that um, you know, insect declines are also being seen in, in South America and Africa and Asia. So the other thing about this graph is that we see these different colors, right? And each color represents a different insect order. And so it doesn't matter which color is which, but the important thing is there's lots of different colors on this map, which means it's not just something we're seeing in beetles, for example. This is something that we're seeing across insect orders. So it's a pretty general pattern that we're seeing. So I'm going to talk about a couple different examples, right? So for example, tiger beetles. In the US, approximately one third of all species and subspecies of tiger beetles are sufficiently rare to be considered threatened or endangered. Just remember, I'm supposed to stand over here. <laughs> um, aquatic invertebrates are also declining. So where they've been monitored, they're, we often find that insect, um, aquatic insects are declining. A recent study found that about 43% of all stonefly species are at risk of extinction in the US. There's a lot more data on butterflies because they're pretty, people like them. They like to collect them and monitor them. So this is a subset of some of the, the research that we have. In Ohio, a 21-year study found a 33% reduction in butterfly abundance over 21 years. In California, we have a nice uh, long-term data set here, 45-year data set started by Art Shapiro and continued. He's still working on it, but his student, Matt Forrester, is also working on it. Matt's at uh, University of Nevada, Reno. 
<laughs> and they're finding declines in all groups of butterflies at the low elevation sites. So widespread um, declines in butterflies in California and the UK. A 10-year data series shows 52%, so half of all butterfly species are declining after 10 years in abundance. When we look at insect communities in general, we see similar things. So this study took place in Germany, and they had been collecting flying insects for 27 years, so almost a 30-year data set. They collect all the insect and then measure the biomass. They had measurements of biomass. And they found a 70% decrease in insect biomass over that time. That's a huge, huge decrease. What's notable about that study is their study sites were in preserves. So these are areas that should have been protected. Um, they attributed um, most of those losses, they think the primary driver there is probably pesticide use. And then just last year in Puerto Rico, another study looking at arthropods, so insects and spiders, comparing, doing similar sampling that was done in 1976 uh, and then comparing that to sampling done in 2012 and finding a tenfold reduction in arthropod abundance during that time. So another huge um, decline in a rainforest. Some things that are notable about this study is that they also looked at vertebrates. So they looked at birds, frogs, lizards, and what they found was that the species that were insectivorous were also declining. But those species that didn't rely so heavily on insects didn't. So here we're seeing a cascade through the food web. And so I think that study that Doug referred to um, with the birds declining in North America, probably some of that is driven by this decline in insects that we're seeing. I mean, we don't have exact mechanisms, but this, this is a pattern that we're seeing uh, globally. And then the other thing about this study is that the authors felt that the primary driver for insect declines was probably climate change. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Now we don't, we often don't know for a particular species in a particular place what is the exact cause, what is the exact driver of these insect declines, but we do know the common causes that are usually playing a role. Habitat loss is usually associated with declines in biodiversity for all sorts of species, not just insects. <coughs> Pesticide use, especially insecticides, um, are a problem. Invasive species, pollution, land use and management, um, how we, uh, how we uh, landscape our yards, for example, and then climate change. So all of these things are, are playing a role in insect declines. So I'm going to talk in particular about pollinators and what we know about the status of pollinators. So you heard this term earlier, keystones. Pollinators are ecological keystones in terrestrial ecosystems. They're, they're very important because more than 85% of all flowering plants require an animal, usually an insect, to reproduce. And it's important to human health and well-being, and we can see that when we look at the produce section. So this is a campaign that Whole Foods did with Circe's to try and raise awareness about the importance of pollinators. <laughs> so this is what a produce section looks like with bees, and this is what it would look like without bees. <laughs> this is our dairy section with pollinators and without. So probably just a lot of plain yogurt. <laughs> no, no flavors there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's pretty grim. But uh, pollinators are also really important, not just in agricultural systems, not just for us, but in our natural ecosystems. So plant reproduction relies often on pollinators, usually insects. And so the fruits and seeds that many mammals and birds rely on um, are a result of that. So they're, they're really important. Um, I think we can all agree, don't have to sell that too hard. Um, so what are, what are the groups of invertebrate pollinators? Well, there's butterflies, moths, flies, beetles, wasps, and bees. And of these, bees are the most efficient and effective pollinators. They're the most important, usually. When people think of bees, they usually think of honeybees. This is what we all grew up learning about, that there's one kind of bee and it's a honeybee, right? But actually, there's a huge variety of bees. 
Um, in the U.S. and Canada, there's roughly 3,600 different species of bees. Here in California, there's about 1,600 species of native bees. And I know Kim's going to tell us a lot more about native bees later. Um, there's, there's a lot of biodiversity in bees, a lot of variation. This is the smallest known bee on the head of the largest known bee. So they range in size from two millimeters, or like one twelfth of an inch, to one and a quarter inches. So there's quite a bit of variation there. Um, Pinnacles National Park, just down the way. Uh, they discovered almost 400 different species of bees at Pinnacles, and it's actually one of the most diverse bee communities documented on Earth. It's pretty cool. Okay, and then just to reiterate, you heard about generalists versus specialists, but uh, uh, I think it's important to come up again. So some pollinators are specialists, so some bees uh, collect pollen only from a narrow range of plants. So sometimes a single genus, sometimes a single family. For example, this is Andrina latoventris. They live in vernal pools in California, and they collect pollen from gold fields like this Lesthenia californica. Other, other bees uh, are generalists and will collect pollen from a variety of plants. And then a lot of bees will collect nectar um, from a variety of plants as well. Okay, so Kim will go a little bit more into detail on different um, native bees and their uh, biology. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the conservation status of pollinators. So pollinators in general are declining, just like other um, taxa. We know a lot of, we have a lot of information on honeybees, right? They're intensively managed for agriculture, and so we have a lot of information on what's happening with them. So honeybee loss, uh, prior to 1995, annual hive loss for honeybees was between 10 and 15 percent. Between 95 and 2006, that rate, rate increased from 15 percent to 22 percent annual loss per year. And from 2006 to today, honeybee hive loss is about 30 to 40 percent a year. So we lose, we lose lots of honeybee hives. Um, we know less about native bees, but what we do know indicates that they're also exhibiting uh, similar declines. So according to NatureServe, leafcutter bees, about 50% of leafcutter bees are at risk, and 27% of mason bees. This is a leafcutter bee. So they cut little pieces of leaf and use it to line their nest cells. They really like red bud. So if you find these um, little circular cutouts in your red bud leaves, it's probably, you probably have a leaf nearby. So don't spray it. <laughs> and bumblebees. We know quite a bit about bumblebees. They're charismatic and they're large and they're easier to monitor. There's 57 species in North America. Of those, 28% are threatened or endangered. So almost a third of, of North American bumblebees are, are in trouble. Four species are, have recently been um, petitioned to be listed under the California Endangered Species Act, and actually the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service just proposed listing Franklin's bumblebee under the Federal Endangered Species Act. So um, <coughs> this one will be protected, the other three may be getting additional protections in California. So why are pollinators declining? It's the usual suspects. We've got habitat loss. Pesticide use, particularly insecticides, diseases and non-native species, and then climate change. So I'm going to talk briefly about, about these first three, and then I'm going to dig in a little, a little bit more to um, climate change. So habitat loss is a problem. This map shows the conversion of uncultivated land to other land use. And you can see, um, especially grasslands, right? Losing a lot of grassland here in the Central Valley, in the Southwest, and then of course in the Great Plains, we're losing a lot of habitat that's getting converted um, to agriculture or other other land uses. Most farmland doesn't actually provide a lot of good habitat for pollinators, though. Um, at Xerces, our pollinator team works extensively with with a lot of really great farmers to add pollinator habitat to their land in forms of hedgerows and cover crops and other things. So we work with a lot of really great people who are dedicated to protecting pollinators. So the news isn't all that. 
Um, but other, other types of habitat degradation, the, the introduction of invasive plants, sometimes herbicide use can decline or cause key species to decline. For example, you probably all know the story of monarchs, um, especially in the Midwest, use of herbicide has um, caused milkweed to decline, which contributes um, to declines in the eastern monarch population. Urban insecticide use. So we heard a little bit about this before. Most people think of ag systems, right? When you think of pesticide use, you think of maybe farmland. But there's a lot of indicators that pesticide use is much higher in urban areas. This is a bee die off, a bumblebee die off, that occurred when a linden tree was sprayed with neonicotinoids. Oh. So here's this area. The square is this. Oh. And then this square is this. So you can see it was thousands of bumblebees died um, after this tree. The tree was in flower and it was uh, sprayed and all these bees um, died. So the problem with neonicotinoids in particular, neonics are systemic insecticides, which means they stay in the environment for a long time. They can stay for months or even years. There's some uh, data showing neonics in tr sprayed on trees sticking around for years. And one problem with it is it gets in the soil. So if you plant a plant that the nursery has sprayed with neonics and you plant it in your yard, those insecticides get in the soil and get taken up by the plants around that treated plant. So it can infect <laughs> a, a lot more plants than the one that was treated and then it gets taken up and expressed in the pollen and, and nectar. So it's really problematic and it, and it can kill bees. Um, so we worry about the use of insecticides, particularly neonics. And then disease is also a problem. So whenever we raise animals together in a group, they're prone to disease. So managed bees like honeybees, but also bumblebees, we raise a lot of bumblebees for commercial use, can um, build up disease, and butterflies too. So people, <laughs> who want to release butterflies at their wedding, maybe releasing animals that have disease, and then they go out and can transmit those diseases to wild individuals. So we worry about um, the, the spread and introduction of disease um, from managed pollinators to wild pollinators. And in fact, um, disease from um, introduced um, from managed bees is implicated in the declines of four bumblebee species, Sabamus terricola, Occidentalis affinis. This is the rusty patch bee, which is the first bee to be listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Franklin Eye is the second, so this one. Um, so there's two federally endangered species that have been, um, their declines are caused by introductions of these diseases from managed bees. So that's a problem. And then, of course, climate change can have a variety of effects on pollinators. So I'm going to talk about that first. Um, I think it's worth reiterating that between 97 and 98 percent of all climate scientists agree that climate change is happening, and that it's a result of human activity, um, particularly burning of fossil fuels and other releasing other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and deforestation. So that's really important which is why what's happening in the Amazon is such a concern. This is Glacier National Park. This is Grinnell Glacier, which has lost 45% of its mass since 1950. The glacier has something like 37 named glaciers, and currently only 26 of them are still large enough to actually qualify as a glacier. So these glaciers are melting. It's just one example that we can see of climate change. So let's talk about what climate change is going to mean for California. And I realized <laughs> your, what, your depression cup is already full. <laughs> but <laughs> maybe you made some room over the break. You have like a, something with chocolate in it. <laughs> so it's going to get warmer, right? And the temperatures are going to increase average temperature somewhere between 4 and 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And a, a word about that, why, why is there that variation? Four degrees and 10 degrees is a big difference, right? It's because the amount of change we see depends on how we behave going forward. It depends on how much fossil fuels we continue to burn going forward, right? 
And so scientists will run these models and they'll use a variety of scenarios. They'll assume we get our act together and reduce carbon emissions or we carry on like nothing's happening, right? And so they get a range so that they can bracket the likely effects. So by the end of the century, it's gonna be somewhere between four and 10 degrees warmer on average every day. Heat waves are going to be longer and more frequent. So between, and, and we'll get more extreme temperatures. So I think heat waves um, are supposed to increase to somewhere between five and 13 weeks a year. We'll have heat waves. It's going to be worse in Southern California than Northern California. Precipitation, we'll have more dry years on average. Um, patterns in precipitation aren't expected to change too much, but because it's warmer, warmer winters will mean more of our precipitation falls as rain instead of snow. And by the end of the century, they're predicting 90% reduction in snowpack in the Northern Sierra, 40% reduction in Southern Sierra. And water is already a big issue here right, in California, and reduced uh, snowpack is going to make that more critical. Extreme events will become more common. So we'll get more frequent drought and it will last longer. On the other hand, we'll get more extreme flood events. So we have both <laughs> sides of the coin. And then uh, fire becomes, well, there's many models suggesting that fire will become more common. So that's bad, but <laughs> When I think about climate change, it's the effect on oceans that really keep me up at night. So sea level rise will continue in the Bay Area, somewhere between two to four feet in sea level rise by the end of the century. In Southern California, up to six and a half feet sea level rise. Um, ocean acidification is another big problem. The oceans absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and originally we thought that was a good thing and there were actually people doing research to see how could we get the oceans to take up more carbon dioxide. But actually what happens is this complex set of, of chemical reactions happens that actually makes the water more acidic. So our ocean surface waters are actually 30% more acidic than they were um, prior to the Industrial Revolution. And that's a problem <laughs> if you're an animal in the ocean that has a shell for example, there's some research testing, um, uh, looking at these little pteropods, so these tiny little snails. And they're putting them in ocean water at the acidity we're expected to have at the end of the century, and it can dissolve those shells. So this is a, a real problem that, that we need to th be thinking about. Okay, so we have all of these <laughs> predicted effects. How will it affect pollinators? Uh, so a few, a lucky few species will respond positively to climate change, right? Some species will do really well under these new conditions, but most species probably will not uh, fare so great under climate change. So there's a variety of ways that climate change can affect uh, pollinators. Pollinator bees and butterflies, all these insects are insects, which means that temperature is really important and it affects the whole suite of of activities and behavior, which I've labeled under physiology, right? So changing temperature can affect uh, pollinator survival rates. It can affect their growth rates, how big they are at maturity, how many eggs they, they lay, how many offspring they produce. It can affect their behavior, what time they can go out to forage, how long they can spend foraging. All of these things are affected by climate change. And that can in turn affect the viability of these, these populations, how, how well these populations do um, in, under future conditions. Rain shifts are predicted for, for many species, not just pollinators, with climate change. So as the climate shifts, some, many species will shift their distributions to track those favorable climates. So in general, species are predicted to move to higher latitudes and higher altitudes. So for species that already occur at really high elevations or far north, they have nowhere to go, right? Not all species will change their ranges, some won't. Some ranges will, will just constrict. What we're finding with uh, bumblebees in North America is that their southern, the southern parts of their ranges seem to be constricting, but we're not seeing much change in the northern parts of their ranges. And then of course, plants are shifting too, right? So specialists, 
rely on particular plants, they also have to track you know, where, their, where their important host plants are. Phenology is the timing of biological events. So for example, when bees emerge in the spring or summer, or the timing of bud burst in the spring. And often they're linked to um, climatic or abiotic factors, so they're linked to temperature or day length or something like that. So if pollinators and the plants that they depend on are responding differently to climate change, we can get a mismatch, right? So that pollinators and their, and their host plants aren't out at the same time, which is especially problematic for specialists. For generalists, there's probably other plants in the environment that, that they can substitute. Plants will respond to climate change and that in turn will affect the pollinators that use them. So changes in diversity of plants and the relative abundance of plants will affect pollinators, right? Um, if you're a specialist that rely on this golden lupine and lupine becomes either more or less abundant, that's gonna affect your population. But there's also evidence that climate change can affect how attractive plants are to pollinators and also the quality of the resources they provide. So it can affect the nutritional composition of nectar. And there is also a recent study showing that the protein levels of pollen from solidago, from goldenrod, decreases as carbon dioxide increases. So there are all these different feedbacks possible between climate change and plants between plants and pollinators, which of course scale up through the ecosystem. And then of course other things are easy to think about. Drought, if we have more drought, there's gonna be poorer, <laughs> poorer resources available to our, our pollinators. <laughs> Species interactions can change. So predator-prey interactions, competition, um, disease virulence, all of these things can vary with temperature, especially if you're talking about interactions among invertebrates, which are again, highly temperature dependent. And then finally, these effects aren't happening in isolation. They can combine with other stressors, such as habitat loss or pesticide use, right? Um, one of the predictions is that pesticide use will increase with climate change because pest populations might uh, respond better to higher temperatures and have uh, faster reproduction rates, which will cause people to spray more pesticides. So we have potential interactions between all of these stressors that can exacerbate the effects on pollinators. In urban areas, we also have the urban heat island effect to think about. So cities are hot, and they're hot because there's lots of impervious services. Um, asphalt, concrete, all of that raises the temperature higher than surrounding areas. So here, this is San Diego. Red areas are really hot, blue areas are, are not hot. Um, in San Diego, the city can be up to 23 degrees warmer than surrounding area. That's a big difference. Um, most of the time, it might not be a problem, but it can exacerbate the effects of heat, um, heat waves or extreme temperature events. And we know this affects people, right? This is a real problem for people as well. And you know, these red spaces, Climate change touches on everything, right? There's social justice issues here, often poor areas or areas with uh, um, high, where communities of color often have less tree cover than more affluent areas, and that affects the temperature in those areas. So if you have a lot of tree cover, um, it's gonna be cooler. So there's also that other interaction because people also, also die during heat waves. Um, it doesn't just affect bees. Okay, so what can we do? How can we make our cities and towns more climate friendly for pollinators? I think there are things that we can do. Uh, first and foremost, we have to create habitat and increase habitat connectivity. This is key to uh, improving climate resilience for, for pollinators and other species. We have to do this. We need to reduce additional stressors in urban areas. I think pesticide use is an obvious one that we can really help uh, we can reduce the urban heat island effect, and we have to advocate for change. Whoops. So I think that um, the last talk presented this really well, but the importance of, of creating habitat. The more habitat we have, the larger a population can be. And a large population is less susceptible to extinction than a small population, right? A lar the larger a population is, 
the more um, likely it will be to be able to withstand bad years or extreme temperature and weather events. So creating habitat can help. Um, the nice thing about pollinators is that even a small garden can make a difference. Just planting a, a pollinator garden um, can, can make a difference. And if you don't have a yard, just a, a container garden in your balcony can make a difference. We recommend using a variety of nectar plants, trying to have at least three different species blooming at all times from spring through fall. Native plants are best. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. But uh, native plants tend to be more drought tolerant, which is going to be really important because we're going to be seeing a lot more drought here in California. Um, and so native species are, do better with drought. They can continue to provide resources for pollinators even when it's dry. Um, and as we heard about, they're more likely to support specialist bees and butterflies. For example, I think there's something like 28 species of butterfly in California that specialize on buckwheats. So uh, there's lots of, lots of native plants that you can plant that will benefit um, pollinators. And having a diverse, um, diverse plantings will benefit a diversity of pollinators. And that's important because, you know, uh, some species, as we heard, some species, species populations go up and down in years when one particular species is having a bad year. Other pollinators can step in and, and we still get that pollination service. So it's important to promote um, diversity, pollinator diversity. Habitat connectivity is really important. Um, habitat patches in your gardens in urban areas can act as stepping stones to help um, pollinators move through the environment, and that increases connectivity. Hedgerows and other linear habitat act as roadways that pollinators can use to move through the environment from, from good areas, you know, in between really yeah. reserves. Um, this is important because increasing habitat connectivity increases population sizes, it increases diversity, and it also increases gene flow. And that's important because a population in general that has high genetic variability is going to be more likely to be able to adapt to climate change than a population with low genetic variability, right? It's more likely going to have the genes that allow it to deal with higher temperatures. So increasing connectivity can help. And we do a lot of work um, with farmers to put in hedgerows and other habitat like this. Um, but you could also do it along road signs in your town. Um, I don't need to talk about this. <laughs> How, if, you, if you want birds in your yard, you need bugs in your yard. That's the bottom line. Adding nest sites to your habitat will make, good, uh, make a good habitat for bees. So this is a, a little nest site for a, a ground nesting bees. Most bees nest in the ground. So having some bare soil will, will allow them a place to nest. Cavity nesting bees use plants with pithy stems, so things like penstemon, goldenrod, um, wild rose. Those are really good uh, plants, so if you don't cut them back too much in the winter, that can provide uh, nesting habitat for those bees. You can use bee blocks as well, just make sure to clean out the tubes periodically so they don't build up disease. And bunch grasses, some bumblebees will, will be, uh, nest at the base of bunch grasses. Okay, the second thing we want to do is reduce additional stressors. So the effects of pesticides and climate change can combine. So you can imagine that maybe a, a pollinator gets exposed to some pesticide and it's not lethal during normal conditions, but maybe during a heat wave or in the middle of a drought, exposure to that pesticide can become lethal. So these factors interact, and so that's why it's important to reduce pesticide use as much as possible. And we advocate avoiding insecticide use for cosmetic purposes, um, and particularly neonicotinoids, including pretreated plants. So annoy your people at the nursery, ask them if they use neonics. Um, I think the more people that start asking for that, maybe nurseries will start to make changes. Uh, we can work to reduce the urban heat island effect. So depaving, removing asphalt and concrete where appropriate can reduce temperatures. So this is in the Bay Area. Um, it was outside of the Target. I took this picture. Wow. They removed the concrete and placed all these growing plants, and it says water quality enhancement area. 
and it's true. So if we, you replace pa pavement with gravel or plants, uh, it helps reduce flood risk, and it also reduces the amount of pollutants that get into our water. So it has a lot of other benefits. <laughs> Planting native trees can especially help with this. So there was a recent study in Madison, Wisconsin, where they were measuring temperature in different parts of the city with different amounts of tree cover. And they found that in areas with at least 40% of tree cover, they got a significant reduction in the temperature, especially during hot days. So that, that effect, that cooling effect of the tree canopy became really important during these extreme temperature events. So it's gonna be really important going forward in US cities um, to keep temperatures cool. And as a bonus, trees, apart from uh, providing lots of uh, caterpillars for birds, they are also really good at carbon sequestration, right? Trees are like giant sponges. They soak up carbon from the atmosphere and store it for a really long time. And then green infrastructure. So this is the um, airport in Portland where they <coughs> have a bunch of vegetation growing on the parking garage. So supporting policies like that in your communities can help reduce the urban heat island effect. And I think, I feel like there's something I wanted to say about, oh, okay. Uh, so this, this is a mural planted by, painted by an artist named Andrico in Venice showing uh, the effects of sea level rise on his city. So that's what this is. Um, <coughs> to really save our pollinators, we have to reduce the magnitude of climate change. So all the things that I've talked about are important. We have to create and protect habitat. And, and doing that also helps to mitigate climate change by sequestering carbon. But it can only go so far. We have to rein in uh, climate change. So scientists agree that keeping warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-level, pre-industrial uh, levels is necessary to minimize the worst effects of climate change. So I can, I can talk about this more if people are interested, but basically the climate agreement, the Paris Agreement, is to keep warming to two degrees or lower. And how it works is that each country voluntarily comes up with their own commitments. And then over time, they're supposed to ramp up their, um, their promises, right? So currently, if every country meets our current commitments, We'll hit, we'll hit about three degrees Celsius by the end of the century. So the good news is we're expected to keep ramping up our commitments. The bad news is no one is actually on track to meet our current um, commitments. So um, <coughs> we can do this. It requires immediate action, but it is possible. It really is still possible to do this. Um, and I can talk more about the difference between one and a half and two Celsius if people are interested. One thing I think, when you hear that number, like two degrees, what's the big deal, right? Two degrees is nothing. But this is average global temperature, right? So this is the average temperature everywhere on Earth from the Sahara Desert to Antarctica. So getting that to move takes a big, big differences locally. And as a comparison, the difference in average global temperature between a warm period and an ice age is about five degrees Celsius. So we're looking at potentially a similar magnitude of change, but in the other direction. So, it's, so the point is two degrees Celsius is a really big change. There, um, the importance of acting now, I just want to talk about how many benefits we could get if we act now to keep warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. If we act immediately, we can prevent the worst effects of climate change. You guys in the Bay Area know how important it is to rein in sea level rise, right? Like this is something that could immediately impact your lives or your children's lives at least. Um, so by, by holding warming to one and a half C, we can prevent the worst effects of climate change. It gives us more time to adapt. So carbon dioxide stays in the environment for, for in the atmosphere for a really long time. So even after we bring emissions to zero, we'll, there'll still be some residual warming. But the sooner we, we <coughs> bring our um, emissions to zero, 
uh, the, the sooner, or the, the more the warming slows, and that gives us more time to adapt, more time to adapt to sea level rise, more time to adapt to more frequent and stronger hurricanes. Uh, it gives us time to plan and make decisions. It gives us more options for mitigation and adaptation. So for example, um, soil is really, really good at storing carbon. And what we find is that in areas with high plant diversity, the soil is better at sequestering carbon than in weedy areas or areas with low plant diversity. But what we also find is that soil is not as good at storing carbon when it's hotter. So if we work to improve soil health now, we get more bang for our buck than if we decide, well, we're gonna wait 30 years until it gets really bad, and then, then we'll invest in soil health. We won't get as much out of it because the soil won't be as good at um, sequestering carbon in a warmer world. <coughs> and acting now will be cheaper and it will take less effort than acting later. If we wait, it's gonna cost more and it's gonna be a lot harder uh, because there'll be a lot more carbon in the atmosphere to deal with. So, um, I know, <laughs> I know very well that this is overwhelming and I know that it can be really discouraging and frustrated, I feel, <laughs> I feel that. But it, there's also a lot of hope because, so last year the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, released a report comparing the effects that we would see if we, if we limit warming to 1.5 degrees versus two degrees Celsius. And the point they made is that it's not too late. There are actions we can take and we actually can do this. Um, unfortunately, the time for you know, incremental steps, like slowly making changes is gone. That ship has sailed. Like we have to take bold action. But what gives me hope is that climate change interacts with so many different aspects of our society. It affects environmental justice. It affects the way our food is produced, what, what we eat. It affects all, all sorts of aspects of our economy. And I think that we can address climate change in a way that also addresses all of these other problems like <coughs> conservation, biodiversity, but also you know, which neighborhoods have trees in them. Um, and that gives me hope because I feel like we have a real opportunity here to make things better if we take it. So with that, I'm, I'm faster than I practiced. Um, I just want to thank all of our amazing donors who make our work at Xerces possible and Sherry and everyone else who, who organized this great symposium. Thank you.